Today I'm, we're going to, this is the last lecture, at least uh, uh, on this topic of the normalization group. And I thought it was fitting that we address one of the sort of major advances or the way in which one of the major advances has been made, namely through dimensionality expansions, sometimes called the epsilon expansion. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll have uh, roughly five, not roughly, exactly five steps in the discussion or derivation today. The first is this, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And uh, let me quickly say a bit about each. We'll start with an Ising-like Hamiltonian, something that we derived in lecture one, namely the landau ginzburg wilson Hamiltonian, which is a continuum version of the Ising model. In two senses, it's continuum in space, but that's not as important as the fact that it's continuum also in the variable. The spin var discrete spin variable is replaced by continuous variable defined in momentum space. So this we had gone through in, in class a little rapidly, but less rapidly in the tutorial. So I will start with this. Uh, second, we will take a specially simple case of this, namely dropping the fourth order term and then keeping the rest. That is known as the Gaussian model. And we will show that the Gaussian model, of course, can be solved exactly anyhow. But we, what we will do is we will solve it using renormalization. This will be the idea. Then we will come to the full Hamiltonian. And of course, we can't solve this problem exactly. So what we will do is that we will treat this in perturbation theory. That is what we did yesterday also, in some sense. De de devised a problem which was solvable. In that case, it was these clusters of triangles. Yesterday, you remember. Today, it's something else. It's the Gaussian model. And the rest of it is this. And we will treat it perturbatively to second order. Now, in the perturbation theory yesterday in class, there was some botch up with the log. But we corrected that in the uh, tutorial. And we also derived the second order uh, correction in, in the tutorial. So I'm going to use that. And this is a rewriting of that. Don't, don't worry about these subscripts i. i and f simply mean interacting and free. F, f is free. This is zeta, not psi. So we will talk about it. This development leads to recursion relations. And I have written them here for this variable r and u. r is a temperature-like variable. And as we change R, we are actually changing the temperature. U is, of course, the interaction. And you see somewhere the appearance of this 4 minus D coming into the recursions. Then, of course, once we have the recursions, it's straightforward. We will linear, find the fixed points linearize. linearize. And what we'll see is that nu is indeed not half as given by main field theory, but there's a correction. The correction is in the first power. We, we are doing only up to first order in the variable. I didn't write it. 4 minus d. Now, before we start, let me just go to the table here. This table shows a list of critical exponents. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, mu. Okay, all right. Here are the mean field values, which uh, you, know, you have uh, seen in one form or the other. Here are the best estimates in, the, in three dimensions, as quoted by Wikipedia. All right. In fact, most, the mo mo most precise experiments are consistent with the theoretical values. And I'm not sure where these values were taken from, experiment or theory. So the yellow ones are the best known values in three dimensions, in three dimensional ising like systems, which include binary fluids, liquid vapor, etc. Here are the 
answers from the epsilon expansion, setting epsilon equal to 1. Why 1? Because 4 minus 3 is 1, or 3 is equal to 4 minus 1. So if you set epsilon equal to 1 and keep not only the first but second order term, you will see there's a substantial improvement in the values of the exponents. Okay, you can see for yourself. I won't go over them on that. One warning. This works if you keep two terms. If you keep three or four terms, the answers go horribly bad. What is that a sign of? Somebody should know. Hmm? I don't think they oscillate, they just go bad. Maybe they oscillate, I don't know. This is the sign that the series that we have is an asymptotic series. And let me just tell you all, since you're a student and may not have encountered asymptotic series, if you have asymptotic series, don't keep too many terms. You may work very hard and get 20 terms. Don't keep all 20. Depends on the value you're trying to evaluate. So asymptotic series do not converge. Okay, so, and there's a theory which tells you the optimal number of terms to keep in an asymptotic series. So, so this is a separate aside. But given an asymptotic series, it is unwise to plug in the value and try to find it. But there are other ways of extrapolating, you know, using Fade Borel sums and so on. And if you do that with the asymptotic series that you have to do at least to fifth order in epsilon, the answers are very good and they match up to at least two decimal places with these best three dimensional terms. So there is something right about the method. The method is perturbative powers of 4 minus d, but even when we set that parameter equal to 1, which might sound large, you are right, it is large, it works so well. In fact, you can even set it equal to 2. And which dimension will you be in? 4 minus 2? 2. You have exact results to compare with. Use Pade Borel. Answers are very, very good compared to the exact answers. So, this, so as a method, this is a good method. And uh, this was the preliminary statement. Let's begin. Okay, now, so let me begin with the Landau, Ginsberg, Wilson, Hamiltonian. And what we did was to say that Z Ising, uh, which was the sum over rho equal to plus or minus half, that whole a set of rows with e to the half rho hat k rho, just to remind you, uh, was given approximately by 2 raised to n square root of determinant k. You don't have to rewrite this, you just recall this, it's in your notes, first lecture. e to the minus half s hat k inverse s plus 1 half si squared minus 1 twelfth uh, si to the 4. And you remember how we got these numbers? We got them by expanding log cosh, which was actually an exact representation of this uh, partition function. K inverse, okay. We prefer to rewrite th this Hamiltonian in momentum space. And I'd written down the answer last time, and I'll just quote it now. So, uh, K, so this is the Hamiltonian. Script K today is the Hamiltonian. Okay, by the way, I'm using the notation and more or less the logic of the article by Wilson and Kogut. And I would urge you all to read the relevant sections also, because I will not be able to fill in every detail today, and you must supplement the lecture by reading this. So k as a function of sigma q's. So we go from variables si to sigma q. Let me write the definition here. Sigma q, uh, write it as a sum, but it could be an integral, si uh, e to the minus i q dot r i. Okay, is this, okay, it's a Fourier variable. And here is the, answer for the Hamiltonian. 
this is the Landau Ginzburg Wilson form that we will be using. It's integral over Q. I'll tell you what it is Q squared plus R sigma Q sigma minus Q. I think I've written it right on the right hand side, but you can just for completeness let me write it again. I'll just write it as 1, 2, 3, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, put in the Qs. Is that all right? Notation. Integral over Q will stand as a short form for 1 over 2 pi to the d. Integral dQ1, dQ1, dQ, up to dQd, d dimensions, uh, over the first real one zone. So in the partition function, what are we instructed to do normally? We are instructed to take an integral over product d sigma q of e to the k, right? Okay, so let me write that at least. Again, notation. We want to save time. No, not only that. Good notation carries you through a bad calculation also. This is a good calculation, so be even better. So this we will denote as, this is a functional integral. So we'll write it as a big fat double integral. I mean, not double, I mean double line, not a double integral. e to the k. So whenever I write this, this is a short form for that. And whenever I write integral over q, that's a short form for this. Don't get confused between the two integrations. The top one on the, in the exponent is the Hamiltonian. If you get confused, go back to the sum. Write it as a sum over q. But it's also this. And this one is an integral over each sigma sub q. So q is an index. There's a field sigma which depends on q. There are many such fields. The Hamiltonian is specified. These fields fluctuate and they give the effects that we want, right? So this is the notation. And this is really the uh, difficult thing to evaluate normally. OK, what is the renormalization group procedure? OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to make an approximation right off. We're going to make several approximations as we go along. The nice thing is that each and every one of these approximations is justified, but it's justified a posteriori. Once we have that answer for number four, we can go back and check each one, and you can, you can show that they are irrelevant. Because we have this notion of irrelevance, we can check whether what we have dropped is irrelevant, and indeed you can check it. We will not do the check today. Read will see. Okay, but Okay, the first thing is, I've written this, and this is what, what we ought to do. We're going to change the region of integration uh, for Q. In other words, we're going to deform the uh, thing a little bit, and we're going to say we're going to integrate over the full sphere of radius 1. So here is the origin. The Luan zone is somewhere there. But we are going to change the integration limit and make it a sphere. And this is very reasonable. The reason it is reasonable is that if you th think about critical phenomena, they are arising from large distance phenomena, which involve you know, correlations of fluctuations far, far away from each other, much, far, much further than one lattice space. So we are interested really in phenomena that are all centered near the origin in momentum space. Because Q small corresponds to very large R. So, so long as we treat that part correctly, the rest will not matter so much. Universality, which in terms of recursions means what is dropped is irrelevant. So, you can come back later and check whether if you include such terms, whether it's relevant or not. The answer is no. And so we keep that. 
Okay, so the first procedure is we recall that region, okay, and we divide it into two in the sense that we draw a sphere halfway, half the radius, and we will integrate over variables. Remember what this is this is Q, momentum space. At each Q, there's a sigma who lives, which lives there. Here, 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 everywhere. We have to integrate over all these sigmas. So what we'll do is we'll integrate over all these. Large Q, we're integrating. That's like integrating this short distance behavior. Recall Niemeyer van Leeuwen. What did we do? We marked off biggish blocks. And we integrated over the small variables, the spins inside the block. This is the momentum space analog of that. Okay, so this is step one. Um, trace over the hashed region. Niemeyer, recall what we did. We did that integration. We did something everything nicely, and then we said the lattice doesn't look like our old one. We wanted it to look like it. So we rescaled the lens. Remember that step? We made the lattice shrink there. Here what we'll do is we'll expand the Q so that this region that's left becomes big again. So uh, how do I say it? Redefine. Q recover units unit sphere. With the objective of recovering the unit sphere. This was a unit sphere. Third, why did we do this? We want the system to look as much as possible like our initial system. Now here, because we have a continuous variable sigma as opposed to a discrete Ising variable plus or minus one, we need to do one more thing to make the Hamiltonian look as much as possible like the starting Hamilton. Okay. This, is called, this step is called spin rescaling, and uh, I'll just call it that. In other words, we will uh, rescale the spins sigma that remain, I mean, I'm not putting the subscripts purposely as zeta times sigma, and uh, the subscripts here are different, that is why I'm not putting them. But there is a, an overall scaling of the magnitude of the field that we that is necessary to do. Both these are done so that the problem is like as much like the old one, like the uh, initial problem. Okay, that's the motivation, and that's why we do. So these are the three steps. Okay, and here I've written what we will find, and I've already written that there. It's good to know what we'll find, you know, and uh, we'll work towards that. Yeah, yeah, quick, quick. Hmm? Step one is trace over the hatched region. That here is the trace. This is the integral over all sigma q's. So everywhere there are sigma q's defined. These are for the large q's. These are for the small q's. Okay. Suppose I just put a prime. I will integrate over all sigma which have a subscript q prime which is bigger than a half. So you should uh, pause and understand. So with this, we have finished number one. Gives us a sense of progress. Only one shell every time. Then we'll expand and we'll repeat. And we'll repeat and repeat and repeat. And we keep repeating forever. At least, you know, 50, 60 times we should repeat. No, no, I'm just saying some number. You should repeat. That's the essence of renormalization. You repeat. All the singularities come because you repeat. 
the recursions carried through infinitely long. Because to reach a fixed point, you need to recurse infinitely long. Okay. So we will, so this is, of course, one step. Okay, so I, I think good. Four. This is actually the essence of the method. You repeat. This is it's important to put down. Repeat. Because now we have a problem that looks like the old, except the coupling constants will be different. But then we don't have to redo the calculation. Right? You just have to change some parameter. Okay. Hmm. Time is passing on. All right. But uh, do stop me if something is not clear. We come to item two. This is the Gaussian model. For which the Hamiltonian K is minus half integral Q squared plus R sigma Q sigma minus Q. Never mind the subscripts, it's quadratic. Anything that is quadratic, you can integrate. Because we know how to do Gaussian integration. In the end, all calculations that physicists do almost always boil down to Gaussian integration. And this is no exception. So this is a very nice model. We can just solve it in one minute for the full partition function, but we won't. What we will do is we will carry out this procedure for this Hamiltonian and see what we get. Is that all right? In fact, this Hamiltonian is what we will be, so we'll, as I said, will be the free part of the full Hamiltonian. It's free in the sense that these modes don't interact with each other. Okay, Q minus Q don't interact with any other Q and minus Q. If you have the four spin terms, there's all these interactions. Here we don't. Okay, so how shall we do it? We'll write sigma Q as sigma's sub zero Q, that is the Qs that are inside, plus sigma one of Q. For any particular value of Q, sigma will be either sigma zero or sigma one. Okay, so sigma zero, is a uh, non-zero here and it's zero outside. The sigma one is a non-zero there and it's zero inside. Clear? Good. So, uh, yeah. Right, so sigma one, so, okay, let me write it explicitly, just a minute. Sigma one of Q, for instance, equals sigma of Q, if Q, is bigger than half. Okay, ha sorry, yeah, so let me put it like this. If half is less than or equal to q, less than or equal to one. On the other hand, sigma zero of q is sigma q if mod q is less than half. So we're imagining the inner and the outer regions in momentum space. And it's the inner ones which are called sigma naughts, it's the outer ones which are called sigma one. Now, I'm going to use this space as well. Move here. So the partition function will clearly be equal to integral sigma, integral over sigma naught. Here was an integral over the sigma, all sigmas. So there's an integral over sigma naught and an integral over sigma one. When I write sigma 1, I mean all the sigma 1 q's such that q is bigger than half. So I'm just splitting this integral into two parts. But the integrand is e raised to that minus integral q squared plus r, etc. Notice that the integrand, I mean something I said already, there's no interaction between different values of mod q. Therefore, this can be split into a product. So first we have an integral over sigma naught, let's say, that is e raised to minus half integral q squared plus r sigma q sigma minus q. Uh, important here is the limit, I mean the 
which queues and the answer is mod q less than half. Let me write it as exp integral. Is this okay? It's the same thing except I've written that integral in two parts. Where is it? Here. Yeah. This is not visible? Okay. Uh, okay, maybe we'll be bold and just use this. So Z, I'm splitting into two parts, e to the minus half integral q squared plus r. And I'm writing the same thing again, e to the minus half integral q squared plus r, taking q comma minus q, except these q's are the q's which are uh, bigger than half, and these q's are the ones which are less than half. What did we say we should do? We should integrate over the yellow region, which means we should perform this integral. Just do the integral. That's easy to do, because each sigma q sigma minus q is a Gaussian integration. I should just uh, point out one thing, that when we write, you know, when you look at d sigma q, so d sigma q, d sig we'll always take sigmas in pairs of q and minus q. This is equivalent to writing an integration over the real part of sigma q and the imaginary part. Sigma q is complex, necessarily, because there's an e to the i q dot r i in its definition. S's is real, but sigma q is a complex. But any complex number is made of two real numbers, which are the real part and the imaginary part. Little i is not called part of the imaginary part. Little i just multiplies the imaginary part. Okay, so there are two real numbers, and we need to integrate over those. Our the way we will do it is we'll integrate over them, but we'll write it like this. Now, so this is the hatched integral, okay? So that can be done because each pair sigma q, sigma minus q is uh, independent. So we just get some answer for that. I'll just tell you the answer in a minute. I'll write it e raised to some script a, and you're left with this integration still to be done. Sigma naught uh, e to the minus half uh, integral q squared plus r sigma q sigma minus. I mean, you may tell me, and you'd be right, that if I can do this integral, I can do that also. You can. You get the full answer, but we, so we won't do it anyway. We won't try to. What is A? A is given by, so you can check this yourself, please, by doing the Gaussian integration, is half sum over Q. You can write it as an integral again. Uh, log of 2 pi over Q squared plus R. What's the value of a Gaussian integral e to the minus half AX squared? It's square root of pi or 2 pi over A. A here is q squared plus r. That multiplies this, so that comes right there with a square root. But then you've taken a log, so there's a half. So this is simple. Okay, that goes over in, into an integral. Maybe we just write it in one shot as an integral with half less than mod q less than y. But this is a constant term. We don't care very much about it. We are concerned with what's left over. What's left over is exactly what we started with, except the range of integration of q in the integral is different, right? And we're integrating only over sigma naughts. So maybe we emphasize that by saying mod q less than half here, not less than one. So we want to make it one. We insist on that. That was part of our procedure. So we'll just define q prime equal to 2q. That will at least stretch the limits. 
you brought in a new function, so there'll be a Jacobian, which is simple, two pi. I mean, sorry, two per degree of freedom. But there are d degrees, so there'll be two to the d. And so this integral becomes, um, okay, so that integral becomes, I, I won't write that integral again, half integral q prime squared over four plus little r sigma of q prime by two sigma minus q, uh, sigma of minus q prime by two, two to the minus d coming from the integral d dq, d dq prime. This is step one in a attempt to make the problem look as much as possible like the old one. So it looks sort of like it because the integration ranges in all match. There's still something we don't like. And that is, look at the old one. Here it is, integral q squared plus r. The coefficient of q squared was one. Now we've got quarter. We don't like that. So what we will do is we'll redefine. And also we have this uh, something floating around. We, we don't like all that. So we'll redefine sigma prime of q prime to be, so now I'm putting a prime on the sigma. So far we had this old sigmas, sigmas. The q index had changed, but there were still sigmas. Now we're expanding the sigmas at each q. Earlier what we did is change the q's. So q was here, next one was here, next one. Now we made them uh, further apart so that we stretch up to one. But on each q there is a sigma. And now we're stretching the sigmas. In the end, it's an algebraic step. There's nothing very much to it, but this is the reason we're doing it. Sigma inverse, sigma prime, no, sigma q prime by two. Okay. And we will choose sigma, uh, sorry, so this is the new factor that we've introduced, zeta, and choose zeta. Zeta is just introduced by us, so the, its value is in our hands to guarantee that zeta squared over four, that's that one quarter, hmm, times two to the minus d. See, this two to the minus d will multiply this q prime squared, right? So it's two to the minus d over four that's coming in. So that times two to the minus d should equal one. Is the motivation clear? The coefficient of q squared we want to beat into one. So, we immediately deduce what zeta is. It's called the spin rescaling factor. It's two raised to d by two plus one. Up in the exponent. Check it, I mean, there's a square there, no? Then, have, so with all these little slightly confusing changes of variables, but they, you know, actually there's nothing. You sit down and just change variables, it's like a five minute job. And you haven't done anything. I mean, you're just doing this and that and, you know, it's not a real, uh, you know, very tough thing that we're doing. So then we get Z with all these not notational changes is E raised to A. times integral e to the minus half integral q prime squared plus r. This goes from 0 to 1. Okay, I think we've achieved what we wanted. Sigma prime of q prime, sigma prime of minus q prime. And that's all. So up to a constant, we've recovered, oh yeah, except I forgot, this is R prime. It's a new R. Okay. And what is the value of R prime? Well, 
just read it off from here. The same factors which multiply this by 4 to make it 1 will also multiply r. So I'm saying it's immediately clear that r prime is equal to 4r in order to do this. This is our recursion. Because we have transformed the Hamiltonian, so you having gotten this, now next step you can drop all the primes if you want. You put in the primes so that we don't get confused with the un, um, I mean the old variable sigmas. But now that we have this full Hamiltonian in terms of Q prime and sigma prime, you know, they're all dummy variables. We can, they're being integrated over each one of them. So we, we could even drop them, yes. So remember, what did we do? We had some factors, 2 to the minus d and zeta and all that, that succeeded in multiplying this by 4, but it's in the same bracket, so even this will get multiplied. Huh? Where? Uh, yeah. This, remember my notation. I hope I have not rubbed it out. Writing less, that leaves us more time to think. This is why Wilson introduces these notations. They're very minor things, but why write if you can, you know, put it in notation? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so in this step, we are, we are integrating over all sigmas, Define it all values of Q, inside and outside. But we're breaking it into two parts. Now I'm saying let us do this integration outside. And the answer for that is e to the a. We don't even care much about it. We just, if you, if you were computing free energy, where you need the constant term, you'd keep track. But we are, you know, at least in this first pass, not doing that. So, but you see what we've done. We've got the same Hamiltonian back with r prime equal to 4r. Is this relevant or irrelevant? r. Hmm? Relevant. What are, in our notation, what is lambda? But that should equal 2 raised to small lambda. Can somebody tell me what small lambda is? Given all this, can, we t can somebody now tell me what the value of the exponent nu is? Loud, loud, half. Because nu is 1 over lambda t, and that's half. So we have recovered the mean field value of nu, namely half. So the Gaussian model is basically another way of doing mean field theory. Since we're going to do corrections to the Gaussian model, it's tantamount to doing corrections to mean field theory. And since mean field theory gives you correct values of exponents above four dimensions, there's a good chance, which is actually realized, that this perturbation theory around the Gaussian model will somehow succeed in giving answers below four dimensions. This is mean field. So we will model it. Okay. Good. Okay. All right. At that point, we tick off number two. We are progressing. Number five will be a short step. So. Very sensitive. If I breathe, it doesn't. Hmm. Today, I think it's more sensitive. You know, this room is a little strange because I'm convinced that time passes non-linearly. Sometimes I turn and so much time has passed. And yesterday, for the last ten minutes, it, it made up, it slowed down. Time dilation. I mean, people here work on relativity. I guess that's the Thing. I don't know. 
Okay, so Gaussian model under control, nu is a half, not, that's not as important as the fact that you have seen, I think there's a section that Wilson calls the renormalization group at work. So this is the first thing that you have. Okay, now we come to the next part and that is the S fourth model. Actually, we've gotten rid of the S's by in favor. S's referred to these. We got rid of the S's in favor of the sigmas. But somehow the model is known as the S fourth model. So it's written in terms of the sigmas, but it's called S fourth. Now, so the first thing we'll do is we'll split K, which is a function of all the sigmas, into two parts. One is a free part. And then there's a part which involves interactions. That is easy. The U term is Ki. Okay. So let's see what is Kf. Kf, the free part, is just the Gaussian part minus half integral Q squared plus R sigma Q sigma minus Q. And Ki is u times that integral. Now notice what we do. Z is an integral over sigma naught. Don't forget, we are always sort of keeping the naughts on the left hand side, so we're careful. We want to keep them. E raised to kf. Now, Kf, we saw, can be written as a sum over terms over all the Qs, including the Qs inside and outside. So let's keep the part of Kf which is inside. So here we are, Kf, and that's done automatically by writing this. So these are only the sigma naughts. Naught means inside. I won't repeat Q less than half, inside. Okay, sigma naught. Times an integral over sigma 1. Because we have the e to the kf left over, which depends now only on the sigma ones, and we can't forget we have ki, which de de depends both on sigma naughts and sigma ones. This is the point, key point. How does it depend on both sigma naughts and sigma ones? How can it? I mean, what is this? What is this u doing? Well, so let's go back to our momentum space. There it is. Let's draw these regions again. Sigma naught is inside, sigma 1 is outside. Now we keep writing this u term as integral 1, 2, 3, this is something, uh, and minus 1, minus. Three. Let's write it as 1, 2, 3, 4, and put in a delta function. So there are actually four momenta. Their sum is 0, that's all. How can that happen? Well, it can happen like this, that all four are outside. For instance, I mean, like we can even put them here. This is, these two are negatives of each other. In which case, when we do the integration over the sigma ones, these will go away. They'll do nothing. They could all be inside also. In which case, we won't do anything. We will just keep them along with a, but it could happen that two are outside and two are inside, right? When we integrate over these, that effect will be felt on these. Look at the nature of the term. This is a U term, four Qs. We're integrating over two, we're left with only two. That is the R term. When we integrate over some of the Qs, the value, new value of R will be affected. It will get something, some contribution from the U. I'm not saying anything very profound, but it's nice to see in a picture why, it, how renormalization will happen. R will change now because of U, because when we integrate those two outer ones, you'll get something inside left over. Is that 
part clear? I mean, at least pictorially, it should be clear to you. Okay? No. Gaussian model is no U. That's right. Exactly. Right. So, so th this term is not as innocuous as it seems. It will do all sorts of things. That's good. We add some spice to everything. Okay, but what we're going to do is we're going to treat this in perturbation theory. So without rewriting it, I'm going to expand this. One plus ki plus half ki squared. And then doing the steps that I outlined carefully in the tutorial, if necessary, I'll repeat, but if not necessary, I won't. Sigma naught e to the kf, x sub sigma naught. I'll be left with an integral over sigma naught of this plus, so, so what shall I do? You know, this step is very simple. Uh, this one multiplied by, oh, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, pull out the effective partition function of the free part as a denominator to the bottom. Okay. We, we work this out in detail, so I don't want to redo it again. Let me write the answer here. So the answer is that this is expectation value of ki, sigma naught, let me emphasize the sigma naught, sigma one dependence, integrated over one. Means integrated over the outer shell. I gave you an example of what might happen when you do that. Some of the queues will be integrated over, but some will be left over. Okay. Plus half k i squared. I'm, I won't write of sigma naught sigma one. You should, if you want. So this is the second cumulant. Is this clear? But come back to our renormalization steps. Trace over the hatched region, that's what we've done. And in a formal sense, this is the answer. But we need to do these two steps also. So let me do them right away and say that the effective Hamiltonian then A prime of sigma Q prime, sigma prime of Q. Okay, so where were we? We had these, uh, so actually you could write a Q prime also, but I'm removing the prime because it's a dummy variable. K prime of sigma prime of Q. After doing these steps, huh? K prime is the new effective Hamiltonian. We haven't written it, okay, no, we haven't written it yet. So I'm saying this is the Hamiltonian after recursion, after the renormalization. Okay, so, uh, result, effective Hamiltonian, so let me write it. Have I written it there? Yeah, I've written it here. Can everybody read this? Yeah. So this is the form of K. Is it all right if I don't write? We'll save one minute if I don't. But, uh, hmm? Okay, I'll write it. KF of zeta, sigma two Q prime, sigma prime of two Q, Plus, okay, then I'll just say refer to the right hand side. But you know what, we, what it is that we're looking for. Okay, but I'll just give you a minute to write it down. You should write it in sequence.
Okay, so this we have derived, but now we actually need to implement this. Okay, write it down if you would like, just think about it for a minute. Yes, sigma prime 2q sigma 1. Okay, there are q's also, but uh, we have omitted them because sigma 1's are being integrated over. Okay, so this is sub 1, meaning that this is an expectation value, you know, with regard to the free part of. Recall, I mean, when in doubt, just flip back a little bit, go back to Niemeyer and look. We had the H0 plus V. We had those uh, expectation values we evaluated with respect to H0. We used to put a sub zero yesterday. You remember? So, okay, maybe I should uh, define it. One second, let me just do that. For instance, I mean, Okay, where shall I define? Okay, let me just use this space. So, for instance, what will k i sub 1 mean? It will mean integral e raised to k f of sigma 1 k i in the not in the exponent downstairs, divided by integral e to the kf sigma 1. So when we are integrating over the outer shell variable, sub 1 here means outer shell variable, we are integrating with the Boltzmann weight given by the free part of the sigma. Right? K i squared of zeta sigma 2 q comma sigma 1. Huh? Sorry? This one. Same as this, except the square is outside the bracket. If you all can read this. Just move the 2 here. I'm sorry for writing so much on the side. I won't mind if you'll just come over, look at it, and go back. You can come. And keep coming. I mean, I'll keep writing. Come. No, I'm, I'm quite serious. I mean, if I were you, I would take the offer. Okay. Anyway, this will stay through the class and beyond. So you can go back and check at the end of the class. Okay. Six minutes. Now we come to the actual evaluations of these. That is a uh, time consumer. And that is the one commodity we don't have. So, I will indicate, read Wilson and Cooper. Even that sort of indicates, and I'll indicate even less, but uh, I'll give you an idea. Okay. Now, when we are about to evaluate, we notice that there are two terms. One is first order in K, one is second order in Ki. So, let's look at the first order term. What is this term? Well, let me write it. So, ki, I'll just write the answer and you'll see that it's right, sub 1, 
is u times sigma naught u1, sigma naught u2, sigma naught u3, sigma naught q4. It could happen that all the four were inside, in which case there's nothing to do. We just write the term. But it could be that some were inside, some were outside, like we said. It could also be that all were outside. Okay, so let me write the coefficient and then argue for that. Six times integral one and two, they will stay sigma naught q1. This is exactly the sort of situation I pointed out, that two are outside, two are inside. These are the two that remain and they are multiplied by the value of the integration when you integrate over q3 and q4 that integral. Well, the value of that integral is delta of q3 plus q4 divided by q3 squared plus r. Okay. I should have uh, one step I omitted when we discussed the Gaussian model, which is an you know, evaluation of the correlation function. Where is the Gaussian model? So we didn't need it at this time, but now we need it. For the Gaussian model, note, just go back and write this, this is sort of important, that in the Gaussian model, sigma q1, sigma q2 expectation is equal to, of course by definition, okay, let me just write it, it's the integral sigma q1 sigma q2 e raised to k Gaussian, which we are now, now just calling kf, uh, divided by integral e to the kf. That's just the definition. The answer is that this is equal to delta function, actually d-dimensional delta function, which we are suppressing the d everywhere, uh, of q1 plus q2 divided by q1 squared plus r, multiplied by 2 pi to the d. I mean, that's from the delta function. So. Okay, so maybe I'm missing a 2 pi to the d. I'm not very sure. I suppose I should have it here. No, actually I should not, no. So that 2 pi to the d need not be there. This is correct. Okay. So this is a very simple to do. It's like saying, if you have a Gaussian integral, uh, space. First we run out of time, now space. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll just recall integral e to the minus half a x squared, we know how to do. But if you evaluate expectation value of x squared, that is 1 over a. That's exactly what is happening here. 1 over q1 squared, q1 squared plus r is multiplying the quadratic sigma q's. So that's 1 over that. So that's the result I'm using here. And why am I not writing the 2 pi to the d? Because I've operated use the delta function already. That 2 pi to the d has cancelled the 2 pi to the d in the definition. Yeah. You check all this. I mean, you know, these are small points, but you may as well get them right. Okay, let, let me finish writing the terms. And then there's a the last term, uh, which I've lost. Yeah, there should be a u outside. Thank you. Right. Plus, let me finally write the, I'll explain where these threes come from in a minute. This is the case where both are outside. I mean, all four are outside, both pairs. Okay, 
This is the answer. You see, it's nothing very dangerous. It's just some integrals. That's it. So what are these factors of 6 and 3? They're very easy to figure out. And the best way to do it is to draw this picture. Every time you have a U, you draw a cross. There's a U here, U here, and there's also a U here. Draw a cross. Why? Because they're a four moment. Okay. If you integrate over any pair, join them. So here we're integrating over 3 and 4, we join them. Okay, maybe if you like min 3 and 4, you can join these. In the sense, let's think of these as 1, 2, 3, 4, or 3, four, any way you like. Here we're joining these and these. These factors come because there are several ways of joining. Nothing more to it. For instance, given 1, 2, 3, 4, I could have joined, uh, let's look at this one, this is easier. I could have joined 1, 2, or I could have joined uh, 1 and 3. Okay, 1, 2 I could have paired, or 1, 3, or 1, 4. When I pair these, the, I don't have a choice, I have to pair a 3, 4, so these are automatic. 2, 4, and what is it? 2, 3. These will come along. How many pairings are there? Only three for this term. Why? Because this and this are identical. But here, you know, I might have contracted this or I might have contracted that. This or that. So the number doubles. Three becomes six. So it's as simple as that. You have to count the number of permutations. How many ways can I get this diagram if I'm integrating over all Q1, Q2, Q3? Are you all with me? It's a small step, but it's a step. Count. The step is called count. Okay. Now, we have to do the same for second order. And we have to draw two crosses now, U and U. And now, number of diagrams proliferates. There are hundreds. Let's organize them quickly. Shall I write them down? Yeah, let me do it. Uh, second order. A, B, C, D. The four classes. Okay. I'll write them only diagrammatically like this, and you figure out what contract means integrate. Okay, so here we go. These are identical to these, multiplied by the same set. In other words, I could have this with this, or this with that, or this with that, or this with that, and so on. You have many, already met many of these. But these will give you zero. Because, see what we have to do? We have to take this term and then subtract this. But this is exactly that, subtracted. Ki, remember, was this, the sum of these three. So when we square that, we'll get this. So, in fact, we'll find most things are zero for one reason or another, fortunately. B. Okay, so it's 48 times. It's sort of interesting to work out what these integrals are. I mean, at least write them down. Plus 72. another 72. Okay. C. 36 times plus 48. Okay. 
plus h okay d Six times this plus twelve times this. Now I wrote all this to partly, you know, impress you all or scare you all. And now I'll tell you that most things don't matter. Okay, these don't matter. Okay, a, uh, we need some other color quickly. Yeah, a don't matter because these are uh, cancelled by. D don't matter because they co contribute to constant. Everything is integrated over. These in principle matter, but many are zero. For instance, this is zero. Let me just show you why. And then exercise show several are zero. Let's look at that one. Write down momenta. Don't write the cues. One, two, three, four. Okay, actually we should have done this four. Then there's this, five, six, then the spot contracted, seven, eight. Agreed? Now, how do you tell quickly? There you have delta one, two, three, four. Agreed? But you also have delta two, three, because you contracted. This multiplied by delta 2, 3 implies delta 1, 4. Keep this in stock. Now, remember these are join. So what does it mean? When do you join? When do you integrate? You join when you integrate. When do you integrate? When they're outer variables. Implying 4 is outer. But one was an inner. So this is impossible. So the answer is zero. There's just no overlap. Like that uh, zero. You can pick up some zeros. Okay. This will contribute to a high order term U6. In principle, we need to be very careful about this because we are generating a new coupling. But we will not show this. This can be analyzed very carefully around the fixed point and shown to be irrelevant in first order in itself. So this will turn out to be irrelevant, and since we know it, we will not bother to write it. Uh, I think I may have forgotten. To, well, uh -huh. This will actually contribute, but you see it's of order u squared, right? I mean, of course, everything is order u squared, and it's contributing to r. It will do if we keep only linear and u for the r recursion. It turns out, I mean, we'll see that. So we can drop it because of that. Okay? Uh, so I'm giving you reasons for why we are dropping things. Uh, this is zero. Too many things integrated over. This can't match this in a variable. It will have to be zero. This will stay. This is important. In, uh, by the way, in the first order uh, things also, this will stay. This is important. Okay. So I've told you that there are many contributions. Fortunately, many of them happen to be zero. Others happen to be droppable for other reasons, like contributing to the constant or to the sixth order term, or in higher order to R. We could keep this term, by the way. There's no harm. But you'll see, then, then you'll have to drop it anyway. So uh, in the interests of economy and, you know, of time, chalk, everything, we will not write that. Is the strategy clear? I, I, I mean, I know you may be feeling a little dissatisfied. We haven't gone through each and every diagram, but it's not hard. Did you understand this uh, argument about why something is zero? Yeah? No. Shall I repeat? Okay. Yeah. Now try to understand it. 
this is the diagram. At the moment, let's just disconnect this. We'll connect it again. Okay, what is this diagram? Well, so that if you like, let's write it. Uh, let me not. Let me just argue. I mean, because I, I've found from experience, I start to write and then I get muddled. It is worse. It has happened once. Before. So let us not risk that. Let 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 me explain. Uh, do you understand why there's a delta function of 1, 2, 3, 4? Because when we write the term u integral, um, what is it? Uh, th there's a sigma q1, sigma q2, sigma q3, sigma of minus q1. So when you add up all those q's, you get 0. There are four of them. That is the delta function of it. Delta 2, 3, why is it 0? Because when I, in, where, where was that answer from that Gaussian? Here. When we're integrating, we're actually evaluating this expectation value. And we, there is an explicit delta function in the answer. So that's the delta function that we have there. From the answer of integration of 2, 3. So I'm saying now clearly, if four things add up to zero and two add into, up to zero, the other two have to add up to zero. That implies this. So far, so good. Now, I'm saying, but you know, we erase this just so that we could concentrate on one, two, three, four. But actually, the diagram is the integrated one, meaning I'm integrating over Q4 and Q5. I'll get some answer, but the important thing is that I have to integrate over Q4. I mean, sigma Q4. But I'm integrating only over outer variables. Therefore, sigma q4 is an outer variable. This is not integrated over. So it has to be an inner variable. But the two are supposed to be equal now, delta 1, 4, but that's impossible. One is outer, one is inner. Have you understood now? Not convinced? No, 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 that is not zero. With the 4, 5 there, that, that is zero. 4, 5 is there. Ah, then it's not zero. Then it's not zero. In fact, it contributes here. Because in second order, we need to join these. I mean, where did these come from? These come, came from all possible possibilities. We just wrote all. I mean, if you like, we were dumb. We, maybe we should not have done it. As we were writing, we should have discarded it. But it's better to put them all and let the jury decide. Jury, have you <laughs> agreed or not? No. OK, what is going wrong? Tell me. Abhishek, I appeal to you as the judge. <laughs> what should I do? Should I go over it again? I mean, is it, is it very obscure? Only I'll be in the plane. Yeah. OK, we'll, we'll do something. But uh, should I write the integral? Then maybe. Uh, let, let's not. Let, let's proceed and let's finish this. And we'll see what we can do at the end. OK, my claim is for one reason or another, many, many are zero or droppable. This is a little hurried, I agree. Yeah. Uh, at this point, we move over here. did not vanish. So I've written here, this contributes to the constant term. And uh, we are not interested in those contributions. We're interested in the contributions to R and U. So we are disregarding that. If you wanted the full free energy, you should keep it. It's not that there's zero. Yes? Yes? That is not zero, 
But uh, what it is doing, I mean, okay, it is not zero. You, you should keep it. But the reason I said we need not keep it is because it is of order u squared, and it is a contribution to the r. And it will turn out in the recursions, okay, we, 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 let's keep it. There's no harm. We can keep it. It, it. it won't matter whether you keep it or not. That's all I'm saying. It is not zero. Okay, now we will attempt to quickly put things together and derive the recursion. Okay. Okay, so doing this, you can work out. Uh, okay, so let, let, let me skip one step in detail. So u2 q and, sorry, u2 of q. Okay, our aim is to find the new r and the new u. There are two steps to do that. One is to do all these diagrams and get the answers. Second is to rescale the Qs and multiply by zeta, as we did in the Gaussian, right? So, so U2 is the resulting, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the coefficient of sigma Q, sigma minus Q before doing these rescalings. In fact, I won't even write it. I mean, there's an integral that, okay, let me write it. U, Okay, there's a u2 and a u4, of course. And what we're going to do is to, okay, so these will involve expressions since we haven't chosen zeta yet. For instance, let me just write one, one of these, sigma zeta squared times d to the minus d. One quarter, very much like what we had earlier, plus r. Except now we have some new terms, 12u times integral d squared plus r plus higher order terms. Similarly, u4 will be zeta to the 4, uh, 2 to the minus 3d times u minus 36 u squared. And the contributions of that term that I said should be kept, 1 over p squared plus r, uh, and an integral of q1 plus half q2 minus p, the whole squared, plus r. Okay. So now we choose, as before, zeta equal to uh, 2 to the 1 plus d by 2. It's the same choice that we made for the Gaussian model. To order epsilon, there is no change. To order epsilon squared, you'd actually have to change the value of zeta, but we don't have to choose. I mean, we don't have to do that. And then we are in a position to write this as r prime and u prime. Okay. P is an uh, integration variable. P, q1, q2, like that. So that first term is this one. Second term is some other one. Yeah. Huh? U2 and, well, actually these are pretty much, so U2 is equal to R prime with the correct choice of zeta, and uh, U4 is equal to U prime with the correct choice of zeta. That's all. So it's the same. It is what it is. It's a function of, uh, I mean, uh, it's the coupling constant, r prime and u prime. What is r prime and u prime? These are the new values of the Landau-Ginzburg-Wilson parameters of the Hamilton. It's exactly that. Okay. Okay with an approximation for the integrals, which is explained in Wilson, which I won't get into. 
The answer is therefore a recursion between R prime and U prime. Here it is, 4 into R plus 3 times the constant times U over 1 plus R. U prime. These were written on the right hand side. 2 to the 4 minus D. U minus 9 C. U squared over 1 plus R squared. So we have completed deriving the recursions. Now, admittedly with a lot of holes in the derivation, but this is what it is. Let us analyze these recursions now. So we'll analyze in two cases. One is dimension bigger than 4 and one is dimension less than 4. If the dimension is bigger than 4, okay, first of all, you notice that r and u both equal to 0 is a fixed point. And both are 0. That is actually the Gaussian fixed point because the value of u is 0 and r equal to r star equal to 0 is the critical point of the Gaussian one. So, first of all, I'll just say that r star equal to u star equal to 0 is a fixed point. We can test for relevance and irrelevance. R, of course, will be relevant. It's a temperature variable because even in the Gaussian model, R prime was 4R. But what about U? Will it do anything? Well, so let's examine. U prime is something 4 minus B. So, uh, is it the wrong way around? No, I hope not. Uh, no, but D is bigger than 4. Sorry, I forgot. Yeah, yeah. D, if D is bigger than 4, this is negative. So, so this is less than 1. So U prime is some number less than 1 times U. So it will be quickly pulled in. It is irrelevant. And that's it. So this is the only fixed point we have. R prime is equal to 4R. And the analysis we did indicates that mu is a half. So mean field theory is recovered above 4 meters. D less than 4. Now, this is still a fixed point. But now, that same 2 to the 4, 4 minus d will be relevant. This is called the Gaussian fixed point, so let's call it G. Around G. So that means if G is here, and this is the R axis here, and U, uh, U let's say here, there's an outflow. Okay. Where does it go? It actually goes to a new fixed point. This is this so-called Wilson-Fisher fixed point. Okay. This is the non-trivial new fixed point that arises. And we can find its coordinates in one minute. So, uh, flow to a new fixed point. I leave it to you to verify that these are the coordinates. R star equals minus 4 C U star and U star equal to one plus ep epsilon log two. I'm expanding 
first order in epsilon. 2 raised to epsilon for minus d is e raised to epsilon log 2, which I'm expanding. Times u star minus 9c u star squared. Okay. Now we will use the smallness of epsilon, which has been assumed because this is first order in epsilon, to find the coordinates. So these two equations immediately give you then u star equal to epsilon divided by, uh, what is it, epsilon log 2 divided by 9c and r star equal to minus 4 over 9 epsilon log 2. I think this is correct as it is. Okay, so there is a new fixed point which has appeared. How far is it from the Gaussian point? It's about epsilon away, proportional to epsilon. So in dimensions less than four, there's a new fixed point that has come out from the Gaussian. Gaussian is still there, but it's changed its stability. It was stable, now become unstable with respect to this new fixed point. So then what is the next thing we do blindly in our procedure? Given a fixed point, we that linearize, okay. We'll write the answers here, delta r prime, delta u prime, defined as r minus r star, u minus u star, okay, renormalized, uh, is m times delta r, delta u. Is this familiar? In other words, you assume there's a small deviation and see how it grows. Then m the matrix M, let me write down for your record. M is the matrix 4 minus 4 third epsilon log 2, 12 C into 1 minus R star. This is R. 0 and 1 minus epsilon log 2. This is a matrix whose eigenvalues you can read off because you, it is in, what is it called? Jordan something form. Huh? Ah, it's in the Jordan canonical form. In the sense that uh, this element is zero, so you can go ahead and uh, cannot be further diagonalized. It cannot be put in diagonal form, but these are the eigenvalues. Okay. So, we are through. So lambda 1 and lambda 2 we know. Lambda 1 is 4 minus 4 by 3 epsilon log 2. Lambda, that means this of course is 2 raised to lambda 1. So small lambda 1 defined as 2 to the lambda 1 equals capital lambda 1, the same way that we always do it. Little lambda 1 can easily be worked out turns out to be 2 minus 1 third epsilon. Once we reach, yes, beg your pardon, this one, this is 1 minus epsilon log 2, I think that's all. And this one was 12c into 1 minus r star. You can plug in what R star is from up here. But actually this value of this element doesn't play any role because we are really interested in the eigenvalue. Notice the log 2 and everything has dropped out of this answer. Clearly log 2 came because we were integrating over half. You could have integrated over one third. Maybe you would have had a 3, you know, something like that. One more minute. So, uh, so, uh, but it's nicely dropped out. It shows something is right about the calculation. You know, these extraneous things that we put in go away 
exponents which will be determined by this will not depend on this. Lambda 2 on the other hand, I'll you look at the other eigenvalue, but it's less than 1, so this will be irrelevant. Lambda 2 is minus epsilon. I have a small doubt, is it minus epsilon? I thought it is minus epsilon by 2, but uh, may maybe I've made a mistake. It's possible, but uh, okay, I, right now it seems to me this is obviously minus epsilon because 1 minus epsilon log 2 is roughly 2 to the minus epsilon, and if I match with 2 raised to lambda 2, lambda 2 is equal to minus epsilon. So let me leave this here. Okay, so we're almost through. Nu. How will we find nu? Nu is the inverse of lambda 1. And that just work out half plus epsilon by 12. So we've reached the end of what we said we would do today. The one thing I've not done, which is actually very, really the thing you should remember, only almost, not only, no, no, I take that, not only, but uh, surely, is the flows. Yeah, so here we are. Here is the new fixed point. I didn't write down the eigenvectors. I should have done it, but never mind. You, you can work them out yourself. There are two eigenvectors. One comes in to this point, out from the Gaussian into here, and the other goes out. This is the one that's lambda 1 the lambda 1 operates, and this is, this is where lambda 2 operates. Lambda 2 is pulled in. Okay. So, what do we have? We have this picture of, first of all, new changing, because we calculated the change. And second, there's a lot of models which are drawn in and have, therefore, the same critical behavior as this, including any deviation from the Gaussian model. The moment your weight function changes from Gaussian to anything anharmonic, zoop, that's Isaac. So, okay. So I think we are at the end of our story for this lecture. We're actually at the end of the story for these five lectures. But I hope you're not at the end of the story for critical phenomena. You all should uh, continue reading this in the sense that, at the least, do read about this from somewhere else. I know this is uh, not uh, totally graspable, but at least I hope you get an idea of the contours of the argument. So that will help, I think, when you read something. You could read uh, Wilson and Cogart. You could read some textbook like Kardar, Volume 2. Kardar has these two uh, books called Particles and Fields, the fields part of it. And uh, there are others as well. You can read John Cardi's book. That is a little terse, you know, and he, epsilon expansion, I looked, checked yesterday, he does in a completely different way from what we are doing here, using something called the operator product expansion, which is uh, a possible way to do things, but certainly not the approach we adopted. And moreover, as he points out, the operator product expansion works only to first order. So here, you can keep going. Go to third order, go to fourth order, second order first. And uh, you will generate more diagrams. Many of them will drop out. Some of them will stay. Analyze them. Do this, do that. But uh, I would urge you to at least look at Wilson and Covert. You know, this is this physics reports, volume 12, 1974. Read it. Read, read the relevant sections. These are the, some of the early sections. See, here are these diagrams. You know, they're familiar. They're there. So you will at least see this. And I've used more or less his notation. So the, you would find it easy to um, make contact. Okay, so on that note, dare I say on that happy note, let us end. Okay, thank you.
nobody expected it to be as good as it is. You know, I mean, look at this calculation. You've done something quite uh, extraordinary. You've expanded in dimension. Who knows what the, but it works. Let's try new. One twelfth of epsilon. Set epsilon equal to one. What do you get? One over twelve. Who can divide by twelve quickly? Point zero eight. Twelve eights are ninety-six and something. So what you what you're finding is that the mean field answer point five is become point five eight. It's not perfect. The real answer is uh, 0.63, but go to second order. I mean, that we haven't done, I'm just quoting an answer. The second order in epsilon, I've said it here, these are the answers. They're remarkably good. But as I said, if you go to third and fourth order, they become hugely bad, but that's because it's an asymptotic space, and you cannot help it. Uh, if there were time, I would explain why it's an asymptotic series, but uh, just believe me. It goes back to the fact that if you have an integral, everything goes back to Gaussian and non-Gaussian integrals. Ax squared minus bx fourth. Suppose you had this. You don't know how to evaluate this. Expand this as a power series in B. That power series is asymptotic. It's very instructive to do that. When I teach statistical mechanics, I ask my students to do this. Expand. It's very easy to expand because then you have x to the 4 expectation value, x to this 8, etc. Easy to evaluate in closed form. You have a series. Put it on a computer for x equal to, I mean, for b equal to 0.1, and see what happens. In the beginning, what you find is that the answers seem to be converging. They converge very well. Suddenly, they go haywire. As a function of the number of terms, what happens? First of all, this can be evaluated numerically. It's a very nice convergent integral. So evaluate it. So somewhere there's an asymptotic answer. Okay, what do you do as a number of terms? Schematically, what happens is you get an answer, then another answer, then a third answer. You think you're doing really well. Now let's get to it. Then you go on, and then notice the deviation, and then it goes wild. How many terms should you keep depends on the value of b. The smaller b is, the more terms you should keep. So I'm just saying this is the nature of an asymptotic series. To read about this and the effects of asymptotic series, read the book by Bender and Odzak. Almost every perturbation theory you do in physics, especially in quantum mechanics, is asymptotic. Don't keep too many terms without thinking. Okay, maybe I've said enough. But you should be aware that asymptotic series are not convergent, and the lack of convergence shows up with a vengeance. Anything else? No. Okay, thanks. For a fantastic set of lectures.